This is 42-year-old Shannon Fox Hamblin. Can you take her for me, please? Motion is sustained. Mr. Winchester, you've been fired, man. I won't go, no, no. Mr. Winchester, please. I want my family back. I've changed. Who's facing allegations of violating her probation terms. So, a bond revocation hearing is going on in Williamsburg, Kentucky, to determine her fate. As if Hamblin's offense was not outrageous enough, her reaction in court was even more weird. At the podium, Hamblin informs Judge Paul Winchester that she is being represented by probably the most popular person in the world. We're talking about... And who's representing you today? I'm represented by Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus Christ might have been known for his wonderful acts of goodwill, but he's not a licensed member of the Kentucky State Bar. Therefore, the judge promptly suggests the services of the Public Defender's Office. So I'm going to appoint Mr. Fendale no, to represent him No, I don't want today. Mr. Fendale. Well, I, I have that right you don't get to choose. You don't get to choose. I, Jesus is going to represent through me. I do not want legal counsel. I have the best counsel, Adam Howard, I've ever okay, represented. Okay, all right. So what do you want to say? I want to say that I have lived hard, <laughs> loved hard, played hard, but I've been saved and applied the blood. I'm pardoned through Jesus Christ, okay? Okay, I have stumbled and I have failed many times and mercies rang from that bench. Not because I deserved it, but because I'm sure somebody prayed. Okay, I wanted to taste salvation and play over here too. I was riding the fence between me and you. God gave me a choice and it's life or death, I kid you not. Do I look like the person that stood before you in August? Do I? I'm humble. I'm going to walk to shame. Judge Winchester has heard enough and attempts to redirect the discussion to the allegations against her. Okay, let me ask you a question. Yes. Allegation is you failed to report to probation and parole. Hamblin is accused of failing to report to her probation officer as required and also testing positive for methamphetamine in a drug test on December 9, 2016. She denies the allegations and argues that she is saved by the blood of Jesus. Allegation is you failed to report to probation and parole. Okay, sir. I have nothing in this world. All I need is an answer. No. Did you go? Okay. I went to probation. Yes, I did. But the next two times, I didn't have no right. Okay, let me ask you another question. Yes. On December the 9th, 2016, you were given a drug test and you were positive for methamphetamine. And that was confirmed by a lab. Saved by the blood. Yes or no? Do you acknowledge that? I acknowledge I'm saved by the blood. Her probation officer is then called to testify. But Hamblin continues to interject her religious beliefs into the proceedings. The judge confirms the validity of her drug test results, but she remains steadfast in her convictions. Well, I, I don't mean, use I drugs, Your Honor. I, I do not that. use it. You've already told me that, but back on December of 2016. His paper says so, but okay. I will not admit it. He said I could. Are you denying the allegations in this motion? Yes. Back in December, did she test positive for her He's not telling the whole truth, Your Honor. Okay. You expect hey, me, me to hear this too. You can ask him a question. Okay, have I not been in contact it. with you on the phone, sir? When you called me and said the drug test came back methamphetamine, tell the truth, show him. What did I say? I did not call you. Ryan, these you are a liar in the court of Winsburg. I promise okay, you. Let me Jesus tell you something. I have to go by what the test he says. He is lying, the, sir. What I'm telling you is. I have to go by what the lab says. It doesn't have anything mistake. to do with what he said. Between me and you. Okay. Prison is to reform me, right? To make me a good person for well, society. Well, that, that and correct? to keep you from breaking the law. Okay. Well, do you believe that the blood applied by Jesus Christ can do more reform for me than uh, Pee Wee Valley? Do you believe it can happen in one day, one minute, or one hour? Well, Sir, I'm sentenced to death. I'm going to die. As the argument escalates, the judge asks for her to be removed from the courtroom, and bailiffs are called to escort her out. However, she resists and is eventually removed from the courtroom. Can you take her for me, please? Motion is sustained. Thank you. Sir, I know I have the right to speak, okay? 
Yeah, no, my wife is ex- I'm going to speak, please. No, I'm going to speak to this judge. No, I'm going to speak to you right now, Your Honor. My life is at stake. I'll die in Tell prison. Me. Come on, yeah. I have I'm a right to I won't go. I won't go. No. Don't, Get me. You need to go. You don't no, want I'm to not. do that to you, okay? No, I'm not. I won't. You need to go. Switch us, please. I want my family back. I've changed. No, they tell me this. I can say they hate you, little child. But I'm doing Jesus, you said I want to go, and I'm thinking, no. But the situation doesn't end there. In the hallway, Hamblin reportedly kicks one of the bailiffs, causing injury, and continues to resist arrest. As a result, she received new charges, including contempt of court, second-degree assault, resisting arrest, and second-degree disorderly conduct. In the end, her bond is revoked, and she's ultimately sentenced to eight years in a Kentucky prison for her actions during the hearing. Can you take her for me, please? Motion is sustained. Mr. Winchester, you've been fired. I won't go, no, no. Mr. Winchester, please. I want my family back. I've changed. However weird Shannon Fox Hamblin's reaction to her sentence was, how does it compare to the strange actions by 35-year-old Daniel Nicholson during their sentencing in Adelaide, Australia? Nicholson is a father of four who's been out on bail while awaiting trial for weapons charges. The purpose of the hearing is to determine whether he should continue to be released on bail before his trial. If you thought Nicholson would have been remorseful for his crimes, you're wrong. Because during their hearing, things got even crazier. As the magistrate, Sue O'Connor, announces her ruling, Nicholson has some questions of his own. I revoke bail. I revoke bail. No, you can stop. What's going on about? Before he can receive an answer from his attorney, Magistrate O'Connor interrupts the conversation. It's clear that the ruling doesn't go in Nicholson's favor, and he's about to be remanded into custody. What's going on about? Take a seat. Take a seat. Miss, please, miss. Please, miss. I'll show you what please, miss Lord is. Honor. In a moment of apparent desperation, Nicholson decides to take matters into his own hands. The commotion inside the courtroom intensifies as officers attempt to subdue Nicholson and prevent his escape. Nicholson's escape attempt escalates into chaos as he tries to use physical force to break free from the grasp of officers trying to restrain him. Amidst the chaos, a woman makes an emotional plea on Nicholson's behalf. But the situation has passed that stage. Eventually, a group of officers are able to overpower Nicholson and prevent him from reaching the exit. Later on, Nicholson admits that he was under the influence of crystal meth during the escape attempt and that he was simply freaked out. He pleads guilty to attempting to escape custody and causing harm to emergency workers. For these actions, he is sentenced to 21 months in prison, with the possibility of parole after one year. In addition to this, Nicholson also pleaded guilty to the original weapons charge and was ordered to pay a $320 fine. However, while it was clear that Daniel Nicholson wasn't happy to hear he was going to spend time behind bars, his reaction to the sentence was similar to the case of 18-year-old Brendan Wazinski. What's up, man? All right. I'm just going to be straight up honest with you. Okay. I'm not a cop. Okay. Can we face the vehicle? At this point right now, you are being under arrest. Do you understand? Okay. Who's facing charges of impersonating a cop at the George Layton Criminal Courthouse in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Six months before the court proceedings, Wazinski had been driving an unmarked car with a police siren and pulled over a driver for speeding. Albuquerque police officer Danny Anzo arrived on the scene and noticed something odd about the situation, leading him to investigate further. You gotta talk to him for a minute. Mm -hmm. Who are you work for? Really, can I sure talk? Oh, okay. I, I know, I'm under equipped. Okay, because uh, do you have an ID with you? I mean, this is this is all I got. I mean, like I said, I'm under I'm under equipped. I was just heading over there to the courthouse. To the courthouse for what? 
to get my crap. Anzo questioned Wazinski about his identity and equipment, noticing inconsistencies in his story. Wazinski claimed to be under-equipped and on his way to the courthouse. Anzo was still suspicious. I know, it makes no sense. I caught him going 120 down I-40. Officer Anzo, while waiting for a response regarding Wazinski's story, engaged in a casual conversation with him. During the conversation, Wazinski stuck to his story and maintained his role as a law enforcement officer. It's, and I'm not here to mess with you, man. It's just the thing is, yeah, he was speeding, dude. You could have called it in. And because if you get into shooting, you're, you're screwed. Right. All right, man. I, I understand. Right. Uh, it, this, for starters, I know this looks really bad. Right. This looks really bad. Uh, this screams whacker. Right. How long you been on? About three years. Okay. I've been on for like 13 years. All right. So, uh, I'm not saying I'm perfect, but you need to be a little bit more careful, all right? So. Seeing how weird the situation was, Officer Anzo requested a supervisor to come to the scene. He then placed Wazinski in the back of his cruiser. Do you have anything on you, man? Any weapons or anything? Keys. Okay. Um, Keys wallet. That's fine. Just have a seat, all right? All right. At this point, Wazinski came clean and admitted that he was not, in fact, a police officer. He confessed to purchasing police equipment online, including a fake police siren. Can you talk to me real quick? Yeah, give me one second. What's up, man? All right. I'm just going to be straight up honest with you. Okay. I'm not a cop. Okay. okay. I'm, just gonna, I'm just going to be Where'd you get honest. that badge from? I bought it offline. Offline. Okay. Do me a favor. Stay, stay in here, okay? For a second. Officer Onzo discussed the situation with a sergeant and, based on Wazinski's admission, charged him with impersonating an officer and took him to jail. Okay, face the vehicle. At this point right now, you are being under arrest. Do you understand? Okay. <laughs> so I need you to lean back a little bit. Thank you. Can I please help my wife? I'll give you um we'll give when we get to the substation, I'll give you um we'll give her a call. Okay? Now, in court, Wazinski pled no contest. The judge sentenced him to one year of probation, including conditions such as not possessing firearms or handcuffs, and undergoing a psychiatric evaluation. Can't carry any firearms, deadly weapons, handcuffs, anything like that, because um, I do not want any kind of reoffense on this kind of um, case. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. However, Wazinski violated his probation by not completing the required psychiatric evaluation. I'll try the best I can, Your Honor. I mean, I have honestly a lot going on right now, and it's it's stressful, but I will find my hardest to get it done. Okay, so just to let you know, we all have a lot going on, and it is very stressful for everyone, but this is very important, and I'm not going to give you longer than that. After discussing his situation, the judge granted him an extension of two weeks to fulfill this requirement. Finally, Wazinski successfully completed the psychiatric evaluation, avoiding jail time. What's up, man? All right. I'm just going to be straight up honest with you. I'm okay. not a cop. Okay. Face the vehicle. At this point right now, you are being under arrest. Do you understand? Okay. However, let's compare the weird actions of Brendan Wazinski to the strange actions of this man at the Wake County Courthouse, Raleigh, North Carolina. Before entering the courtroom, visitors, attorneys, and court employees are mandated to go through the main security checkpoint, as you can see. This man here has gone through security and is now picking up his personal belongings from the container at the security checkpoint. In a small mishap, he inadvertently drops his wallet while collecting his things. Unaware of this, he proceeds to the elevators. Later, when he attempts to pay a court research fee on a different floor, he realizes his wallet is missing. Inside the wallet was a substantial amount of cash, totaling $1,600. Thankfully, someone returns the wallet to another security checkpoint within the building later that day. But this is where the story takes a different turn. The cash is no longer inside the wallet. Prepare for a twist that will make your jaw drop. The security team initiates an investigation to trace the sequence of events. Moments after the wallet drops, this man passes through the security checkpoint and immediately notices the fat wallet. He keeps his cool, walks up to the area, and picks up the wallet as coolly as he can.
Here, he heads toward the elevators, seemingly inspecting the wallet's contents. This individual goes up to the fourth floor before returning to an elevator. The wallet, still in this folder, remains with him. Upon arriving on the first floor, he hands over the wallet to security, minus the cash. He claims to have found it in a bathroom. Security tracks him down and subsequently apprehends him within the courthouse premises. It's revealed that the man is Stephen McElvary, a defense attorney and part of the court proceedings. He's convicted of misdemeanor larceny and faces disbarment. Eventually, he was fired, barred from practicing law in North Carolina, and ordered to repay the stolen $1,600 to its rightful owner. However, this defense attorney wasn't the first person to behave weirdly in court, like in the case of Joey Watts. The defendant in a case involving charges of aggravated assault and felony possession of a firearm in Grant County Courthouse in Sheridan, Arkansas. Watt is accused of threatening a woman with a shotgun at his residence. In the courthouse, the scene appears quite casual. There was no officer in sight, and Watts' attorney, along with some individuals, were chatting and possibly checking their smartphones. The jury is in the process of deliberating the charge related to the possession of the firearm. However, there's a significant development. Watts has been found guilty on the assault charge, a verdict that likely means he's headed for prison. While the crimes committed by Watts are abhorrent, his courtroom conduct will leave you speechless. In an astonishing turn of events, Watts calmly walks out of the courthouse, as cool as can be. With no bailiff in sight, he calmly exits the courtroom and enters a stairwell. As he makes his way down, he seems entirely unconcerned, with no one attempting to apprehend him. Once he reaches the ground floor, Watts gestures towards something or someone. Clearly unmoved by his actions, he saunters towards the main entrance, walking out of the courthouse without any interference. Outside, Watts picks up the pace and starts running, clearly enjoying his newfound freedom. While he might have initially thought he had succeeded, the story takes another twist. The courtroom's jury returns with a guilty verdict on the weapons charge. Watts' taste of freedom is short-lived. He's apprehended by the police the following day. However, the story gets more complicated when it's revealed that his escape wasn't a solo endeavor. Three other individuals, including his brother Jesse Watts, seated here, are arrested for aiding his escape. His brother, Jesse Watts, is found guilty and receives a six-year prison sentence. Joey Watts himself eventually returns to court, where he's sentenced to a combined 36 years in prison, 10 years for the assault charge, and 26 years for the weapons possession charge. Interestingly, no additional charges are brought against Joey Watts for his daring escape. He becomes eligible for parole in 2025. However, just when you thought you've seen it all, another convict surpasses Joey Watts' wild courtroom display. Enter attorney Michelle McDonald. who's representing the mother in the child custody hearing case in Hastings, Minnesota. We're on the second day of the trial, but before the official proceedings start, McDonald approaches the court reporter, accusing her of inaccurately recording the previous day's testimony. She asserts that if the court reporter can't fulfill her role, she'll take over. She then takes out a phone and snaps a photo of the courtroom. This draws the attention of this courtroom deputy, who informs McDonald that photography is prohibited in the district courtroom and confiscates her camera. Despite some initial tension, the hearing eventually resumes. However, during a later recess, deputies approached McDonald and presented her with a contempt citation for violating the photography rule. McDonald is escorted to a holding area for processing, but she refuses to cooperate or provide her personal information. As a result, she is taken into custody. In an unusual turn, she's handcuffed to a wheelchair, a tactic mainly reserved for violent offenders. McDonald is wheeled back to the courtroom, and despite her predicament, McDonald maintains a surprising level of composure. However, McDonald declines to engage with Judge David Knudsen, 
or present evidence for her client. At the end of the proceedings, McDonald promptly files a federal civil rights lawsuit against Judge Knudsen and county personnel, alleging improper treatment during her courtroom appearance and subsequent 36-hour detainment. However, this legal action does not play out in McDonald's favor. Instead, she faces her own set of consequences. She's given a 60-day suspension and two years of probation for various reasons, including repeatedly speaking over Judge Knudsen and taking unauthorized photos in the courtroom. This case got worse when the Minnesota Supreme Court took action by indefinitely suspending McDonald's law license. This decision stems from her false accusations against Judge Knudsen, which were seen as undermining his integrity in the original case. However, McDonald isn't alone in their courtroom actions. Let's not forget the weird incident involving David Hall, who identifies as a sovereign citizen, a belief system that claims that specific laws do not apply to him. Sir, today I'm appearing as the agent and settler for David Hall. I'm not the person, sir. Okay, well, I am you not see the, the person, person, David Hall, tell him he's not leaving jail either, all right? Hall was charged with driving under the influence and driving with a suspended license and is in Broward County, where Judge John Hurley is presiding over his bond hearing. However, the real shocker came when Hall unleashed his madness in the courtroom. As Judge Hurley starts reading the charge, Hall interrupts. Mr. Hall, DUI, expired driver's license. Good morning, Judge. Sir, I haven't said for the court how I'm appearing today. Hall just told the judge that he hasn't yet stated how he's appearing in court, but the judge informs Hall that he will address that shortly. Today, well, sir. I'm not asking you yet. Just give me a moment, all right? I need to look at your record. However, Hall's strange legal approach continues, and he identifies himself as the agent and settler for David Hall. Sir, today I'm appearing as the agent and settler for David Hall. Okay. Okay. Could you get Mr. Hall for me then, sir? Where is he? I go by that name, sir. My name sounds exactly like the defendant's, and I'm here to settle that matter today. The judge inquires whether Hall and David Hall are the same person, to which Hall responds that he's an individual, not a person, and differentiates himself from David Hall. So are you and David Hall one and the same person? I'm not a person, I'm an individual. David Hall is a person, I am a private individual. This exchange leads to some confusion, but the judge keeps his composure. Undeterred by Hall's legal maneuvering, Judge Hurley decides to set the bond while sarcastically acknowledging Hall's multiple self-identifications. May I, may I say something else for the record, sir? Go ahead, sir. I appear here today as the settler, agent, not the person, but the individual. And I, I, I don't think I should have, you understand the so difference the between a person and an individual. Agent, and you're the individual, but you're not the person. Is that correct? Correct. Got correct. It. Let me, I'm going to write that down. However, the judge notes that Hall's new charges are a violation of his original bond conditions. As a result, regardless of how Hall refers to himself, he won't be released from jail unless he can pay the bond amount. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, the settler, the agent, the individual, and uh, maybe even the person, David Hall, uh, has been charged with DUI. So today, the court's going to set your, uh, the settler, the agent, the individual's bond, and even the person's bond today, $10,000, because the settler, the agent, the individual, and the person has not stopped driving, even though the settler, the agent, the individual, and the person continues to drive without a driver's license. If may I post bond, sir? Finally, it's Judge Hurley's turn to play games. Well, is there are any you, other? Are you may... asking me as the settler, the agent, the individual, or are you asking me as the person? Sir, I'm asking as the individual appearing before you today the Wait, opportunity. Wait, who are you speaking on behalf of right now? Sir, I don't understand that question. I well, believe that you're trying to confuse well, me now. I'm not the person, sir. Okay, well, I am you not see the, the person, person, David Hall. Tell him he's not leaving jail either, all right? Well, have a nice day. In the end, despite Hall's creative approach to identity and law, his bond is set at $10,000, and he is not granted bail because he violated his existing bond conditions. Sir, today I'm appearing as the agent and settler for David Hall. I'm not the person, sir. Okay, well, I am you not see the, the person, person, David Hall. Tell him he's not leaving jail either, all right? However, while David Hall's behavior raised eyebrows, it's nothing compared to the unusual actions of Calvin Lloyd Griffith. <laughs> who was accused of breaking into a local school and stealing an employee's car. Griffith is charged with grand theft, 
burglary, trespassing, and violating his probation from a previous car theft. He is now at the Miami-Dade courthouse before Judge Catherine Puller, who's presiding over his bond hearing. While the magnitude of Griffith's crimes is concerning, his courtroom behavior will leave you in disbelief. As Judge Puller begins addressing the case, Griffith attempts to interject and provide information about his probation status. However, his continuous interruptions prompt court officials to cut off his microphone to restore order. Calvin Lloyd Griffin Jr. on page 12. Good morning. Mr. Griffin is charged with burglary, petty theft, grand theft of a vehicle, and trespass. He's on probation. He's out on probation, Yana. Yeah, I'm on probation. I'm on paper. Okay. Office being here anyway because I smoke weed and cocaine. Office being here anyway because I smoke weed and cocaine. Griffith then attempts to communicate with the judge through gestures, but when that doesn't work, he does this. <laughs> yes, very funny, but Judge Pooler was unamused by his antics and continued with the case. State is requesting that your owner set the bond, but reset the case in division tomorrow because his actions violate his probation. Eventually, the judge agrees with the state's request and sets Griffith's bond at $18,500. She also issues a warning against Griffith returning to Miami Edison Senior High, as there is a statewide order barring him from the school. And there's a statewide order from Miami Edison Senior High. If you should get out, do not go back there. You're not a student anymore. <laughs> Calvin Lloyd Griffith is a prime example of a convict acting crazy in court. However, could stealing your favorite sports team jersey and wearing it to the courtroom be considered even a little crazier? Like in the infamous case of Nelson Walker. You're charged with stealing a dolphin jersey? This ain't the one, young. No? No, ma'am. Who's facing a charge related to the alleged theft of a Dolphins jersey in Miami-Dade County. Judge Ward, presiding over the case, appears skeptical of the situation. She questions Walker about the Dolphin jersey he's wearing, which leads to an interesting exchange. You're charged with stealing a Dolphin jersey? This ain't the one, young. No? No, ma'am. Huh? It's shown on that that I ain't took no jersey. Walker denies stealing any jersey, and he also asserts that the Dolphins jersey he's currently wearing is not the one in question. This prompts the judge to turn to the public defender for his input. Public defender. As to Mr. Walker, respectfully, Your Honor, we're going to be raising a problem with causes. The public defender raises a concern about an inconsistency in the police report, particularly regarding whether it was one hat or two hats involved in the case. Walker seems to agree with the public defender's approach. As to what? As to this being a felony. Because uh, the allegations uh, are an observation of observing the defendant and co-defendant put on a dolphin hats. The officer says A and then says hats. So there's an issue as to whether it's two hats or one hat. But clearly the allegations are the co-defendant. Taking these points into consideration, the judge orders that Walker, who has a history of 29 prior felonies, be held on a $5,000 bond. However, in the following weeks, Miami-Dade prosecutors decide not to press charges against Walker, leading to his release. Despite this, the judge mandates that Walker stay away from Dolphin Stadium. Now, that's a hurtful punishment. You're charged with stealing a Dolphin jersey? This ain't the one, young. <laughs> no? No, ma'am. However, while some may attribute Walker's action to fan passion, it pales in comparison to the unfathomable behavior of Derek Wright. Who's facing a speeding charge in a Louisville, Kentucky courtroom. At first, the atmosphere seems calm, but things take a turn when Judge Sarah Michael Nicholson notices something in Wright's paperwork. We can make everything better. Let's be right. As he tries to leave, the judge stops him. It comes to light that Wright has an active warrant related to domestic violence, something Wright disputes as a mistake. Whoa, whoa, where are you going? Where are you going? No, not to the No, no, no. Okay. So I can't go to the restaurant. Okay. So can I make a call from my mom? Amen. 
You can do it. The true shock lies not in the crime itself, but in Wright's jaw-dropping behavior during the sentencing. After confirming the warrant's validity, deputies move in to take Wright into custody. He asks for a chance to call his mother. It's unserved, so it's still good. Okay. 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 Sir, you need to calm down, okay? They're gonna go ahead, they're gonna execute this. They'll let you take some time to call your mom. Uh, just stay quiet, don't say anything, okay? While they try to lead him to a spot for the call, he resists, and a struggle ensues. The deputies manage to subdue Wright, but when he continues to resist, one of them uses a taser. Wright screams in response. Eventually, they get him under control and remove him from the scene. Thankfully, neither Wright nor the deputies sustain serious injuries, though one officer's glasses get broken. Following the incident, Wright is charged with third-degree assault, resisting arrest, criminal mischief, and disorderly conduct. He pleads guilty to the assault charge and receives a three-year probation period. Other charges, including the initial speeding offense, are dropped. However, while Wright's behavior was shocking, it's nothing compared to the utter mayhem caused by 25-year-old Jesse Rose, who once aspired to be a rugby league player, but is now in a courtroom in Wollongong, Western Australia, for a sentencing hearing. Rose had pleaded guilty to the charge of reckless wounding for an assault that was captured on surveillance video. The incident occurred in a pub, where Rose and his friend were asked to leave by security due to Rose's drunken behavior. Instead of complying, Rose and a security guard became engaged in a physical altercation. The situation escalated when Rose threw a drinking glass at the guard, severely injuring him. During the sentencing hearing, Rose's attorney argued against sending him to jail, claiming he had turned his life around by maintaining a steady job and living responsibly. However, Judge Andrew Hassler was firm in his decision, stating that the assault was too serious for leniency. Rose was sentenced to 14 months in prison. However, Rose's reaction to the sentence was far from subdued. In fact, he went crazy. Thankfully, officers were at hand to stop such craziness. As a result of his courtroom outburst, Rose faced additional charges of property damage and assaulting a law enforcement officer. These actions led to an additional eight months being added to his original 14-month sentence. However, as we saw Rose's discontent with his sentence, it brings to mind the strikingly similar response of Travis Davis, Brandon Banks, Kelvin Grimmage, and Keela Richardson during their sentencing hearing in Ocala, Florida. This group of individuals had been found guilty by a jury of killing Courtney London during a robbery home invasion that had taken place two years earlier. While the crimes committed by this gang were reprehensible, their conduct in court will make your blood run cold. At their sentencing hearing, there was a heightened level of security, with extra officers present due to the nature of the case. However, chaos erupts unexpectedly during the proceedings. Right, so what I've, I've indicated that um, I would like to do is to have the, the gentleman... Hang on, Mr. Davis.
Travis, Davis appears to resist being handcuffed by a court officer, leading to a struggle. Another officer quickly intervenes to assist. Kelvin Grimmage also resists attempts to handcuff him, adding to the confusion. The situation quickly escalates into a physical altercation involving the court officers and the defendants. Amidst the chaos, Kilo Richardson, who had already been handcuffed, is escorted away from the melee. Davis's lawyer, Daniel Hernandez, becomes involved in the scuffle and is apprehended by the officers. With the situation spiraling out of control, a court officer brings in a taser to regain order. Reportedly, all three of the defendants involved in the altercation are tased, including Brandon Banks, who doesn't actively join the physical struggle. After the court officers manage to regain control of the situation, Davis and Grimmage share some parting words before being taken into custody. In the end, all four defendants were convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life without the possibility of parole.